Abu Jambo wapendwa. Hey. So please turn to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. Today I will be preaching to you on the ascension of Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 24. Right in the final few verses, verse 50 to verse 53. Let me read to you. Then he, that's Jesus, led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we glorify your name. We give you praise and we give you thanks through our Lord Jesus Christ, who is at your right hand enthroned over all things and whoever lives to intercede for us and pray for us. Lord, I pray that as we come to your word this morning, you would be with us. Lord, open the eyes of the blind. Encourage those who are in suffering, Lord, and in pain. And Lord, draw us near to yourself. I pray, Lord, that you would help me to preach this message as I ought, and that you would give everyone here a heart to receive your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, what is amazing about this passage to me is how brief it is. Just a few verses. Luke's gospel is perhaps the longest gospel. And just a few verses for the ascension of Jesus Christ. But we don't measure the importance of a text by its length, okay? We measure the importance of a text by its meaning, by its content. And there is so much meaning packed into these few verses. And I will not even be able to draw it all out today. But there's a lot of allusions in this text that teaches us about Jesus Christ. So. I want to make a few introductory remarks about this text, some observations, okay? The first thing we need to recognize about the ascension is that it is a bodily ascension, okay? This is Jesus rising physically, and Luke is very clear about that. If you uh, pass your eyes up a bit to verse 36... One of the things that the disciples were wondering about, they had seen Jesus appear a few times after his resurrection. And they were so confused. We've never seen a dead person rise. And they couldn't really believe that it was Jesus. And then verse 36 we read, As they were talking about these things, that is the appearances of Jesus, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they saw a spirit. And Jesus said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed him his hands and his feet. And while they disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of, of boiled fish and he took it and ate it before them. Jesus rose as a man. He rose as a man. And he ascends as a man. Some people have tried to say, oh, the ascension is somehow Jesus spiritually ascended. And he's spiritually in heaven. But no, this is, a, this is a bodily ascension 
of Jesus Christ. And that means he, he is in heaven bodily also. As a man. That's the first remark that Luke wants us to know. And that you will see the relevance of that as I go on. Another remark about this ascension. Is it's also a very much a spiritual event. That is happening here. You will see in these verses that. Jesus blessed them. He blessed them. Before he ascended. And then as he was lifted up. In a cloud. In a glory cloud. They responded to him in worship. And they blessed him. In return. So something very deeply spiritual. Is happening here. In this, in this account that Luke is telling us. There is something about Jesus rising. That produced great worship. In the hearts of the disciples. And the third thing, which links to the second, is that you will, if you, I, I believe you've read through Luke recently in the church. As you read through Luke and all of the gospel accounts, you, found, you find that the disciples always misunderstood who Jesus was. They, they marveled at him. Some of them doubted. Some of them disbelieved. Some of them thought, maybe... Some of them thought that Jesus had come to bring the kingdom of Israel on earth. And actually, if you read the account in Acts of the Ascension, they say to him before he sends, Will you now restore the kingdom of Israel? They never really understood who Jesus was. They were very confident in themselves. You remember Peter, isn't it? I will not deny you. I will not leave you. And then, when people questioned him, he denied his Lord. They never understood who Jesus was throughout his time being there. But now when he ascends, all of a sudden, they worship him. And they are filled with great joy. And they are continually in the temple blessing God. What happened there? What brought about this change? It's actually very strange, isn't it? If someone leaves you, what is your response? If, if, if pastor after all this time shepherding his people and then he, today he just left you and you, you start going hey pastor I'm in <laughs> I'd be very worried that's a no, not a normal response in fact either there would be something wrong with pastor or something wrong with you but the way this is portrayed this was a good response isn't it in fact, that's what Jesus said, isn't it? If you remember in John, it is good that I leave. You should be happy. Don't be sad. When he told them, when he predicted his departure, they were very sad, isn't it? But now they are joyful. Very strange response. Now, why did they respond that way? What changed? I believe we see the answer somehow in verse 44, just before this event of the ascension. Jesus is speaking to them, and Jesus knows, and he's often rebuked them, that they've not understood what he came to do. And he says to them in verse 44, Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. That everything written about me in the law of the Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance and forgiveness should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my father upon you but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high notice their minds were opened isn't it and that means previously their minds were what closed isn't it they had a they had a specific idea about the messiah about jesus and they they fixed their minds on him as a king who will come and restore Israel on earth. And they couldn't see him apart from that way. That was their framework. 
And Jesus says, no. And then he opens their minds. He, he, he teaches them from the scriptures who he truly is as the Christ, the suffering Messiah who dies and rises to provide forgiveness of sins. And you should also be careful, brethren, that you don't put Jesus in a box. A nice box that fits what you want him to be. Jesus is who he is. You cannot make him into one thing when he is another. So the, the apostles, the disciples, suddenly understood who Jesus was. And that to them, then when they see him ascend into heaven, it all makes sense. It all makes sense to them. So what we need to do, if we want to understand the ascension here, we need to understand how it is a, a, completion, a, com, a completion and a progression of Jesus' earthly and heavenly ministry. Okay? That's what changed for the disciples, isn't it? They understood the scriptures about him. And there's three ways that commonly we talk about the work of Jesus. Uh, and they are all alluded to in the scriptures at many points. His threefold office. We sang about it in one of our hymns earlier. That Jesus is a prophet, priest, and king. Isn't it? Those are three of his key offices. And all of those are massively affected in his ascension. Okay? And the, as a prophet, a prophet represents God to the people. Okay? That's what a prophet does. He represents God to the people. A priest represents the people to God. He's appointed by God to be their representative on behalf of of man, as we saw in, in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1. And then a king is one who exercises rule and dominion. I wish I could go through each of those offices with you and how the ascension brings it brings them out. But today I'm only going to look at his priesthood. Okay? The priesthood of Christ. And how it is drawn out in the ascension. Because that's, I think Luke, he, he brings that out strongly in this passage, okay? What does it remind you of when Jesus is lifting up his hands to bless the people? That's a benediction, isn't it? And the priest was appointed to do that in the Old Testament. In Numbers chapter 6, 22. Aaron who was appointed as the priest of Israel and his sons were told to bless the people. And so in Leviticus 9, verse 22 as well, he, he, he lifts up his hands and blesses the people after giving his sacrifice. And that's what Jesus does. He, 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 he leads out his, his disciples to Bethany. He lifts up his hands and he pronounces blessings upon them. And as he's blessing them, is lifted up and ascends into heaven. Such a hard thing for us to imagine. But I, I'm praying that as we look at the priesthood of Christ, you will see the significance of his ascension for that ministry that he holds. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. But I want to stop a second and address an issue. Okay? You remember in Hebrews chapter 5 and towards the end he stops himself he's talking about the high priestly ministry isn't it in Hebrews chapter 5 and then he stops and says about this we have much to say and there is much to explain but it is hard to explain because you have become dull of hearing do you remember that? How much we lose by our dullness of hearing. There are so many treasures that the scriptures have for us. So much to say about Jesus Christ. 
and so much that his people miss out on because of dullness of hearing. I don't know how you are thinking about this. Even as I've started, I've been speaking quite a lot of the scriptures to you, isn't it? And the, the priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. Does that excite you? Or are you not really bothered? Are you already bored about this? Is it practical? You might be thinking. Then you don't know what I've been going through this week. How many problems I have. Give me some practical advice. Don't talk to me about the ascension. That one is not practical. I hope that's not how you feel. Paul, Paulo, in Colossians chapter 3 verse 1 says this. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Christ is your life. He is your life. How can you say, Ah, oh, I don't really want to know about his priestly ministry. How can you be bored about such things? Christ is your life. I think we have made so small out of Jesus in the church in Kenya. Jesus is a... I don't even know what he is to most people these days. Just someone to help you along in life. Some kind of spiritual force. We use his name to make things happen. Jesus is the life of the believer. He is everything. And he makes amazing calls upon your life. He calls you to trust in him. To have faith. To believe in him. Whoever would follow me must pick up his cross and deny himself and follow me. He who hates his life will find it. He who loves his life will lose it. He who is not willing to, do, to, to hate his father and mother for my sake is not worthy of me. Jesus is our life. Everything is about him. Everything is about him. How can you trust in him whom you've not known? How can you give up your life for him who you don't know? Who you don't love and long for? I think, though I'm speaking strongly, I have a lot of hope for you at Bethesda. I love the way that you take the word of God seriously. I love the way that you exalt the Savior. That you come, that you listen to his word. And I want to commend you, but I also want to give you that warning at the same time. Okay? You must continue in this. You must draw near to God. Paul said that um, I know him whom I've believed and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. What persuaded Paul? It wasn't his church, isn't it? It's not, ah, oh, God has brought me this far. I'm persuaded. It's, I know him whom I've believed and I'm persuaded. You cannot follow, follow him whom you've not known. So I, I really want to encourage you. What I will be saying in this sermon is quite deep. 
it's quite theological. But I pray that you concentrate and you receive it. And don't, don't just stop there. Keep going deeper with Christ. Drink deeply from his word. And, and some of this is for us to be spiritually minded. Okay? That when the, the author speaks to the, the... In Hebrews, he speaks to the congregation. He's telling them, exhort each other. Exhort each other. Help each other to dwell on Christ. And to believe in his name. The, the, the book of Hebrews is a sermon. Did you know that? book of Hebrews is a sermon. Very, that is a very difficult sermon to follow, isn't it? But that's, that's the mark. That's what we should be doing. We need to know Jesus Christ if we want to follow him and proclaim him in all the earth. So be, be Christ-minded. Okay? After the service, don't just speak about general things in your life. Speak about Christ. Ask your brother, Brother, how's your walk with Jesus going? Or brother, what have you been reading recently? Brother, have you thought about the, the threefold office of Jesus Christ? Maybe as your sisters together, maybe preparing food, washing the dishes, walking together, whatever you are doing. Talk to each other about these things. There's so many questions that we can raise about Jesus. And you have a very informed pastor here, you should ask him these questions. Amazing thing, and an amazing thing as we come to consider the ascension. What a, a glorious thing that Jesus ascended into the heavens. What does it mean for us? So, that was a side point. I want us to now see Jesus' high priestly ministry. Okay? If we want to understand the ascension, we need to understand it in relation to the rest of his life and his ministry. Okay? So, maybe the first question why do you need a high priest in the first place? Okay? Why do you need a high priest? Remember, a priest is someone appointed by God as a representative on man's behalf. Isn't it? Hebrews chapter 5 verse 1. But why do you need a representative? No one, no one in this room could enter God's presence and live without a high priest. I, I don't know why I don't know why some preachers speak as though we can just all come to God and He accepts us as we are. We say things like, Oh God loves you, just come as you are. God loves you as you are. Just come to him. Uh, why would a book like Leviticus be written if you could come to God as you are? The whole point of the book of Leviticus and much of the Bible is that we cannot approach God and live. He dwells in unapproachable light. And we are full of sin. We have transgressed against him. And when you see people, when the presence of God comes down in the Old Testament, the people respond in great fear and terror. You need a representative before God. Remember Isaiah? Isaiah walks into the temple and all of a sudden he sees a vision of God on his throne. And his robe fills the temple. And there's these cherubim and seraphim praising God, singing his praises and covering their eyes as they go around his throne. And the temple is shaking. And Isaiah's response is, Woe is me! 
Woe is me. That is, I'm a dead man. For I have seen the Lord. And I dwell among a people of unclean lips, and I myself have unclean lips. Isaiah, a godly man in his generation, a prophet, saw the Lord and thought, this is it, I'm a, I'm a dead man, I'm gone. For he knew that you cannot enter the presence of God and live. What about Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus chapter 10? They were appointed in, as sons of Aaron in the Levitical priesthood. That means they, they had the job of being a priest before God as a representative. And they approached him not according to the rules that God had set. And what happened to them? Consumed with fire. And they died. We need a representative before God. Partly because the first priest failed. Adam, Adam is a type of priest. Adam is a type of priest. He's a representative. He's our representative by nature. Adam. And we are all seen as in Adam. And Adam had the, the, the calling upon his life as created by God to represent God to the people, to exercise dominion upon the earth, and to be man's representative before God. But Adam disobeyed. He transgressed God's law. And what happened to Adam was he was cast out of the presence of God. He's cast out, taken away from God's presence, and he was not allowed to return. And in Adam, the whole of humanity has been cut off from God. Cut off from the giver of life. We cannot enter his presence and live. And you, you see this, don't you, in just your daily walk in life. Life is full of so much suffering and pain. There is so much that we see which is wrong with the world. And each of us, if I talk to any one of you individually, you'll be able to point to things in your life, tragedies in your life, sufferings, pains, sorrows. And all these are there to teach us that we cannot enjoy the goodness of life without the Creator. If we try to live life according to our own rules and our own wisdom, we will be lost. But it's not only that our separation from God brings suffering and pain, but it also causes His wrath to come upon us against sin. And that's why when people would enter his presence, they were full of fear. They were full of fear. So you need a high priest. Some of us can be so uh, casual with God. So casual. Remember Jesus, we read this also, that he was heard by God because he prayed with great reverence. Isn't it? Reverence is godly fear. Even Jesus, the Son of God, incarnate, prayed to God with a, a, a godly fear, a reverence, a love. And we need to recognize that, brethren, that when we are approaching God, He is a massive God who dwells in unapproachable light. And you dare not approach Him on your own accord. You need a high priest, you need a representative. And God in his mercy has provided us with one. But before I look to Christ, we all know this is heading to Christ as our high priest, but before I go there, we will see that the priestly ministry of Christ comes out clearer as we see the priestly ministry that was given in the Old Testament. Okay? The Levitical priesthood. Israel was brought out of Egypt. They were delivered out of Egypt by God, by miraculous signs. And it was God's will, his gracious and merciful will, that he should have a people with whom he would dwell. 
a people that he can bless a people that he can lead for the sake of his own glory and he brought out Israel and he arranged for them a priesthood so that they could enjoy his presence and I want to make some points about the function of this priesthood okay what 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 does a priest need to do in order to represent the people before God one he must be one of them isn't it you cannot represent someone who you are not a part of isn't it i cannot represent kenya in the olympic games and i'm a very good shot putter you would do well with me <laughs> but i can't is it why not i'm not one of you i could not even get this for duma namba <laughs> <laughs> i tried by the way but i could not <laughs> so it must be one of them to he must be appointed by god we read this in hebrews so uh god appointed the tribe of levi to represent the people of israel but when he goes before them before god to represent the people aaron was commanded to wear 12 stones on his shoulders and each stone represented a tribe of israel so we shouldn't think that israel would just pray to god separately and meet with god separately it was all in this priesthood it would be through this priest that israel would come to god in the tabernacle where god dwelt among them and he would represent all of the people and he would bear the sins of the people in order for the people of god to enjoy god's presence they needed to be forgiven of their sins sins separate us from god our sin has separated us from god so in order for us to dwell with him our sins need to be taken away so that we may enjoy his presence and how was the sin taken away it was taken away through a sacrifice they would sacrifice a lamb goat they had all of these offerings that they were called to give to god in order to make an atonement for sin and the the law behind that is that the wages of sin is death all sin is judged by god every sin is judged by god and his judgment upon it is death and therefore when they presented a sacrifice to god their 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 sins were being laid upon this sacrifice this lamb and the lamb would be slaughtered and his blood he would be presented to god the lamb would be presented to god as a sacrifice for sin and the blood was a sign of that sacrifice being shed for the people and then the priest would enter the presence of god and this was a fearful thing that the priest would do you remember i told you about adab and nah na- abihu and nahab isn't it imagine imagine seeing them go into the tabernacle and being brought out as completely burnt bodies could you imagine seeing that that's what imagine then having to go back in there you would be so scared isn't it so fearful let us follow exactly what god said and he has said so many rules leviticus for most of us is a very boring book isn't it we all we all skip that book in our bible reading plan leviticus is there to tell us you cannot approach god apart from the way he has commanded you must approach him in the way that he's commanded so the high priest would go in with this sacrifice he would present it before god and he would go into the first part regularly but the holy of holies he would go in once a year to present the high priestly sacrifice and god would consume this sacrifice 
and it would achieve atonement for the people. Remove their sin from them and then they would receive the blessings of God. They would receive his blessings. And the high priest would come out of the tabernacle having been with God and he would bless the people. He would give them assurance that God is for you. He will guide you. He will lead you into the promised land. Receive the blessings of the Lord. But this was something that had to be repeated regularly. I'll read you a, a quick passage from Leviticus. You don't have to turn there. Um, Leviticus 9 verse 22. Aaron has just presented the sacrifice in the tabernacle and then he comes out, verse 22 it says, then Aaron lifted up his hands towards the people and blessed them and he came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings and Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting and when they came out they blessed the people and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people and fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of fat on the altar. And when the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Amazing things. The blessing was achieved through the sacrifice of the high priest. And he gave it to the people. And they, they saw the glory of the Lord after that. They saw his glory. And they were so amazed by his glory that they fell on their faces and shouted. Oh, how we need to, how we need to fear the Lord more. To reverence him. It's not a small thing to enter God's presence. And you all, all of you will enter God's presence. You will. It is appointed for man to die once and then comes judgment. You will enter God's presence. Do you have a high priest? In Adam... Adam is not a sufficient priest for you. In Adam we are all condemned in the first man. By nature, you are sinful and under God's wrath. And I take no joy in telling you that. I know a lot of preachers don't like to tell you that. Because they think, oh, we don't want to be harsh, we want to be welcoming. But brethren, I'm not loving you unless I warn you of the wrath of God to come. I'm not loving you. In fact, I don't care about you if I don't warn you. Isn't it? I remember a story once in the UK I was told by a preacher. He used this illustration and I'm, I'm stealing it from him. <laughs> Preachers are thieves, they say. <laughs> so, he was talking about there was a time in, in London on the M5, M25. And a, a truck had crashed on the road, on the motorway. And you know, our motorways are very organized, not like these Kenyan motorways. People are very organized. And, and this one had crashed. And normally you would be fine because lights would come and say, danger ahead, go slow. But the problem was, they were so misty. Is that the word you use? Misty. Clouds. Heavy clouds. And they couldn't see. Even a meter ahead you could not see ahead of you and cars they could not see the warning lights and each of them kept flying into this truck and they would perish they would die car after car were kept going into this truck and the, there were policemen and there were firemen by the side and they were trying to warn these people that stop stop but they wouldn't listen and they kept going and people were dying and perishing 
And the policemen were so devastated that they started throwing cones at the cars. Throwing stones at the cars on the, on the windshields to get them to stop. Because they wouldn't, they had no other way. And people just kept dying. Brethren, if we don't warn people about the wrath of God, they won't be saved. They will die. We need to warn people. It's not, it's not something you will enjoy doing. But you need to warn people about the wrath of God. People need to stop walking in sin. And they need to repent. And the only way that they can find forgiveness and salvation is through a priest. You can't save yourself. Let's forget about that. You cannot save yourself. You need a priest. You need a priest. Jesus is the high priest. Jesus is the one sent by the Father to save his people. He was appointed a high priest. I want you to turn to Hebrews because I'm going to keep quoting it now. Hebrews chapter 5, this one was read in our hearing. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. God in his eternal plan to unite all things together in his son appointed before the foundation of the earth, Jesus, as the high priest of mankind. Jesus, our high priest, appointed by God, the Son of God, who has lived eternally, who is, our, who is himself the creator. Everything was made by him, through him, and for him. And he was appointed to be the high priest. And remember, a high priest has to be what? A representative of the people. Isn't it? So, Jesus, the, the Son of God, became incarnate. That is, he, he became a man, fully, truly a man, in order that he might be our representative. He humbled himself and added to himself human flesh so that he would be truly a man and be able to represent his people. And just like the high priest would wear the twelve stones on his shoulders for the tribes of Israel, so Jesus comes wearing his people. They are, he, 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 he comes for them to represent them. This is a new Adam. A new Adam has come. And Jesus came and he humbled himself and he bore the reproach of his people. He bore their sins upon himself. And this led him to the cross. The cross which his disciples could not understand. But that Jesus had become the Lamb of God. And he, he, he himself will be the sacrifice that propitiates the wrath of God. I'm sure pastor has taught you that word propitiation. To satisfy God's wrath. Christ sacrifices himself on the cross. And he rises again. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the vindication that he has paid the full penalty of sin. Death could no longer hold him. For he has paid it in full. And he rises and conquers sin and death. I turn back a few pages chapter 2 of Hebrews verse 14 to 18 since therefore the children share in flesh and blood he that is Jesus himself likewise partook of the same things that is flesh and blood that through death he might destroy the one who has the power 
of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. He partook of our flesh. We who have been under the power of death, enslaved to it. Death always has the last say. No man has defeated death except for the man Jesus Christ came to conquer sin and death. And he did that through the cross. He conquered death through his own death. That book by John Owen. <laughs> what is it? The, the death of death in the death of Christ. I wish you could read that book. <laughs> That's what Jesus does on the cross and in his resurrection as priest. And he presents this sacrifice is seen by God the Father. And this is now where we are coming to the ascension, isn't it? And we see the priest risen from the dead, lifting up his hands to his disciple and blessing them. Blessing them. And, and then he rises as priest, blessing the people of God. And then he comes before the throne of God. He enters the Holy of Holies. The, the heavenly places he ascends to. And he presents the sacrifice to God. The sacrifice that fully propitiates the wrath of God. The sacrifice that is acceptable to God. And in doing that, as he ascends, the disciples see the glory of the Lord taken up in the cloud. The glory cloud. They see him and they worship him. For they know he has gone to the heavenly places as our priest and representative. In him is our salvation. Hebrews 9 verse 24 puts this beautifully. What, what is happening in the ascension? What is he doing? Verse 24, For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, like in the Old Testament. But he's entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor is it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest entered the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, Jesus has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He puts away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Priest of man enters into the presence of God. Our priest. For all those who are eagerly waiting for him, he will return and save them. What a great hope we have in this high priest. No wonder the disciples worshipped. They, they saw all of this. They saw it as he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And their hearts were lifted up to him. Oh God, thank you for Jesus, our high priest. What a saviour. We have hope. We have a man in heaven. A new humanity has entered into the presence of God. A new Adam. And that all are united to him, who have him as their priest, will likewise be resurrected from the dead and enter into the presence of God eternally. For he has achieved an eternal redemption. And we will see the glory of the Lord. What an amazing thing. And I've not even spoken about his office as king and prophet. That as prophet he continues to speak 
better things than the blood of Abel. And he speaks through his church. That as king, he sits on the throne. On the right hand of God the Father. And rules. He has authority over everything. Even as I'm speaking to you, Christ is ruling from heaven. He, he knows everything and he commands everything. And as one who has authority, he continues his priestly ministry for you. He prays for you. He intercedes for you. He sympathizes with your affliction for he knows what it is like to be tempted. You do not have a high priest who doesn't know what it's like to be human. He knows that you have one who is without sin and who has purchased the eternal pleasure of God. And you have this hope. So I'm going to finish with these verses from Hebrews 10. I just keep chucking verses at you until you see it. This is He is pleading with the people here to to approach God in full assurance since we have such a high priest. Verse, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up in love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You've heard him, brethren. You've had him. Have full assurance of faith. Faith, as Pastor said, it is trusting in him that as the day comes when he will return, you have hope of salvation. Even now, God does not have any, anything of condemnation towards you, but only love and peace. Our great Savior. Encourage each other in this. Exhort each other towards these things. I could go on in verse 26. Very, very important words for you to heed. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law, the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of of the living God. Know that you have forgiveness in Christ, but do not trample it under your foot. We are saved by faith and faith alone, but that faith leads to repentance. But when that temptation comes to you to sin, and it comes to all of us, and we all fail in many ways, Think about Jesus and his cross. Don't trample underfoot the Son of God. Trust, put your trust in him. I want to say to those of you who don't know Jesus, or maybe you think you have, but you've realized in this sermon that you are not ready to approach God. And maybe you're wondering, how... How can I have this Jesus as my high priest? The answer is trust in him. Repent. Trust in him. Behold him who died for the sins of his people on the cross. Behold him who resurrected and ascended to the throne of God. And trust him. Let him represent you before the Father and you will be saved.
Let's pray, brethren. Lord Jesus, we worship you. We worship you, Lord. You are great. You are very, very great. And we thank you for humbling yourself to become a man, just like one of us, Lord, with flesh and blood, so that you would, you would save us and represent us to God and bring us up to the throne of God by your grace that we might enjoy the presence of God what a joy it is Lord to stand in your presence what a joy and a privilege and this joy is ours only through your sacrifice so we thank you Lord and I pray for those Lord who are lost in sin Lord and are blind I pray Lord that you would open their eyes to their position before you let them not be deceived. Let the veil that Satan puts over our hearts be removed from them so that they might see your glory and repent and find forgiveness. Father, we pray for the rest of the day as we continue to meet together. Help us to have spiritual conversations that build each other up in love, that we would exhort each other to trust in you and have faith. And that you would do mighty works through us that bring glory to your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.